Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started so we stay on track here. My name is Linda Hall, and I'm one of the founders and current president of Connected Community. Uh, we want to welcome you to our third annual Transition Summit, which is the finale of our 2016-2017 Educational Outreach Series. Our first speaker today is Marcy Frawley, and I want to start by thanking you sincerely for stepping up at the last minute to replace our original speaker who was unable to attend due to a family health situation. Marcy has been a senior consultant at Griffin Hammes Associates since 2011. She has vast experience in employment first policy and implementation in Illinois with expertise in customized employment and the impact of work income on public benefits. It should be noted that Marcy has been an integral part of Connected Communities' Customized Employment Initiative from day one, having trained both Barb Tobias and I to be certified employment specialists way back in 2014. We learned from the best that everyone can work, no matter what their disability, just takes the right job with the right supports. You will hear a little bit about CTC's Customized Employment Initiative immediately following Marcy's presentation, but suffice to say, employment is for everyone. Please help me welcome Marcy Frawley. Thank you, Linda, and thank you, everyone, um, for having me here today. It's a, a real pleasure to see such a fantastic group. You ha heard a little bit of an introduction of me. May I um, find out about you all a little bit? Um, I'm wondering if, if folks who are parents and family members would raise their hands so I Wonderful, amazing. How about folks from the school district? Excellent, Saturday morning and here you are. Okay, great. Well, um, I'm gonna ask one other question because I, I gave you too much paper for my presentation, so I'll probably be skipping some of the slides. Um, there we go. Um, skipping some of the slides to make sure that I can go over thoroughly the things that are most important. How many people are attached to the Social Security public, system, public um, cash and health care? A fair amount. OK, well, if it's OK, we'll, we'll be touching on that, too. Um, we're going to, we have a, a lengthy um, goals for today, or, or lofty, I should say, in that we want to make sure that we talk about um, employment first, which is a policy that's relatively new or being implemented um, fairly recently in Illinois um, with the use of the employment strategy called customized employment that Connect to Community is using. Um, we're going to be talking about discovering personal genius, which is a function of customized employment through Griffin Hammes Associates, and how we can incorporate that into our school transition process. How can we put um, portions of customized employment into our school planning without burdening anyone? It, it can be a rather natural process, but we'll talk about that throughout the presentation. And then lastly, um, Linda said that we definitely go on the premise that everyone can work. What their work is um, chooses to be depends on ideal conditions for employment. It, um, it's based on interests and skills and abilities. But sometimes folks um, choose not to work because they're afraid of how it's going to negatively impact health um, insurance through Medicaid or Medicare, or the cash benefits. And I want to give you some, a few work incentives to show you that not only can people work, but they should work to their fullest capacity because there are work incentives in place that are going to help, um, <clears throat> excuse me, maintain those very important uh, work, in, uh, work incentives. So um, has anyone heard of Employment First? A little bit. It's kind of a simple um, policy, but you wouldn't think so the way it's um, having difficulty being implemented in, um, in our state. 
Employment First is offering individuals the opportunity to work first. And the reason Employment First has um, incorporated customized employment is that we believe that individuals are ready to work as they are. You don't have to be fixed in order to go to work. You don't have to be trained. You don't have to have those soft skills or um, some um, hygiene issues that sometimes people prevent people from working. So Employment First is saying that the first option that should be offered to every individual is Employment First. This was implemented in Illinois um, in 2013 in a policy signed by Governor Quinn. And most recently, Equip for Equality, are you familiar with that? It's a protection and advocacy um, organization here in Illinois, which is extremely um, proactive for the rights of people with disabilities. They wrote um, a blueprint for Employment First, and I put that um, hyperlink on your um, PowerPoint for you to look it up later to see what they're suggesting. But essentially, customized employment is um, individualizing the employment relationship between employees and employers that meet the needs of both. On the um, Griffin Hammes associate logo, we say we're creating communities of economic development. So we're not just an employment strategy, it's all about building the economy, building communities, and that's what we're very, very proud of. It's customized employment, employment is um, individualized and it's based on a person's um, needs and interests and, but very important to meet the needs of the specific employer. What excites me so much about customized employment is it's getting to know your community. It's getting to know where the needs are. We're not filling jobs that could be filled by um, veterans or um, people of low income. We're creating jobs that are specific to the individual that will specifically help the business grow. So that's why we're an economic development policy or, or strategy. This that's up here was from the Federal Register in 2002 a federal document that was de uh, developed by the Office of Disability Policy at the de um, U.S. Department of Labor. So this isn't Illinois specific, it's nationally. And I'm just really proud to say that Illinois is picking up on this now. <clears throat> so customized employment um, may include employment development um, developed through job carving. Have you heard of that term? Where you're taking out certain tasks of a job. It could be self-employment, as some of you are hearing more and more businesses that are starting for um, people with um, disabilities who, um, first of all, have a passion for the product that they're um, selling, and then um, it, it gives them that satisfaction to be providing that product or that service. So, or it could be restructuring strategies that result in job responsibilities being customized and individually negotiated to fit the needs of the individual. One of the um, first experiences we had in customized employment was in a very small town in rural southern Illinois. <clears throat> and my colleague went with the job, um, job placement specialist to a small hospital. And um, when we did a tour, what we, we used the um, strategy called an informational interview. And so they took a tour of this hospital to learn about the hospital what goes on, all the different departments, and as I said, it was a small hospital. 
So they took this tour, and at the end of the day, they asked, now, is there something, um, some tasks that some of your workers have said they really don't like to do? And they said, well, actually, there is. And that is, at the, at the end of every shift, the nurses on the wards were supposed to gather the outgoing mail that had accumulated during the day, and then they were to take it down to the mail room, process it, and get it out to the mailbox. Okay, these are nurses, highly skilled, very professional women. So uh, a negotiation was made with the hospital to um, develop, to create a job for a young man to go around at the end of the shift to pick up that mail and process it. What do you think that did for the nurses? It was a huge few. You know, who would want to do that at the end of the day? So what we did was we created this job. Now what gets even more exciting, and this is what we really like about customized employment, is that the job was created for a young man specifically. That young man had good reading skills, good organizational skills. He was kind of on the shy side, but he was going to be perfect for this job. It was a good match between the business needs and his abilities. Unfortunately, he had some major health troubles, so he wasn't able to start that job for several months. They held it for him because the relationship had been built between that young man and his business, this business, that they wanted very much to have him do this job. So customized employment is relationship building, it's um, individualization, it's um, matching and negotiating. Cool, huh? So the challenge, the challenge is to create lasting, satisfying, person-directed, you hear that a lot now, don't you, employment beyond traditional job development. So we want to break the conventional molds of simply washing off tables at fast food restaurants um, to look at a broader the, the whole community and business world, as, as that's our oyster now. No, we don't have to go to those go-to jobs anymore. Let me um, give you another example of um, a, a, a non-traditional type of job, and that is that um, a small after-school program, again, in a... I think this was uh, around the Champaign-Urbana area. Um, very small community, no public transportation. Um, so looking for um, businesses that might have needs that were within reasonable transportation ability for the person. A job was developed for um, this young woman in an after-school program. Now, um, she's a, when we do customized employment, I'm going to be talking about the process. But the process um, looks at ideal conditions for employment. We're not going after a job, per se. We frequently are looking at themes. And for the themes of this young woman, her themes were reading, sports, and animals. So. Anyone have any ideas of where we might have ended up? Nope, the world's our oyster, so who knew, huh? We actually went to an after-school program. And have any of you seen that movie, Toy Story? And there's the one, um, the one scene where you're looking into that daycare center and it's chaos. Well, that's what we saw when we were, started doing our job development for this young woman. Now the reason we went, why, why did we go to an after school program with themes of sports and reading and, and animals? Well we went there, or, or the way it, it ended up tying in was that when, after she had been there for a while and she had been talking with the kids, 
the natural conversation was, I have a dog named Mitzi at home. Do you have a dog? And um, the reading led, she started out as a snack aide, and now she's a teacher's assistant. And as a teacher's assistant, when she's done with her, her snack aid work, she now sits and reads with the students, or these kids. Here's the life-changing piece. And sometimes we don't always think of employment as life-changing, but I see it every time I talk to someone who's been going through customized employment. Annie was rather shy. She was um, downright quiet um, and did not have a lot of words to impart. Well, after she had been on the job for six months or so, dad was picking her up after work. And one of the little kids said, bye-bye, Annie, have a good weekend. And Annie turned and said, bye-bye, say hi to your dog, Mitzi. And the dad's mouth just fell to the floor because this was his quiet Annie who was fully involved in her workplace and, and had developed all these relationships with her, um, the students and then her teachers. So why do we look at customized employment? There actually is a pool of, uh, a shrinking pool of uh, workers these days. Have you noticed that? That as the baby boomers are coming to retirement, there's more and more um, openings of jobs. So um, cu customizing employment for our folks can fill a very specific need. Also, we're seeing that dis disability is more of a natural occurrence now, especially aging and people with disabilities have similar issues so that they're, they're being um, addressed universally. It, so it, um, it makes good business sense to hire people with disabilities. What is customized employment? Are, are, are you aware with supported employment? Sometimes we've heard of supported employment is with job coaches. That's how we um, put it together. Well, support, customized employment came from supported employment. It is an approach to employment. Customized employment is not labor market driven. We don't go to the, the want ads to find a job for, through customized employment. We're also not necessarily looking for the dream job. When Annie went to be a snack aide, I think um, we were all extremely thrilled that within a year she p was promoted to teacher's assistant. We did, you just don't know sometimes how a job could grow, but you, that's what you're looking for is to get into a job where there is room for growth. Customized employment is not vocational evaluation and testing. And it's not in interest inventories. And that's really hard, because that's what we're, we're used to doing, isn't it? And we're also very used to saying, what do you want to do when you grow up? And many, how many kids actually know what they want to do? And sometimes they might say, well, I'd like to be an airline pilot. And maybe that person has severe visual issues. So we don't just, we, we want to use those I want to statements and explore the theme around it. I was really excited for one of my, um, actually it was my boss, Carrie Griffin, who worked with a person with a theme of aviation. He liked planes. He liked um, things that fly. So they went to a, a local airport and talked with a helicopter um, company. And that they were able to discern some jobs for this young man to do around helicopters. Um, so, so even though a, a dream job might be a pilot, the, the fact is the person just really wanted to be around those types of machines. Another person I worked with um, had been a phlebotomist 
um, before he had several traumatic brain inj injuries. Needless to say, um, the seizures that he was experiencing and memory issues, his drawing blood wasn't going to be an, a possibility when he became um, more stable. What it ended up, he, and he was dead set on going back to being a phlebotomist. What it ended up was he really wanted to wear the white jacket. He wanted to feel that he was part of the medical field. So a job was um, developed for him at Quaker Oats in their testing area, and his job was to um, put the test tubes in that machine that sterilizes, I can't remember the name, but he had to wear a white jacket and he wore, um, he worked with um, prof other professionals that wore white jackets and that did, that did the trick. So the evolution of customized employment came with um, that horrible beginning of institutionalization and of course there was never any thought of employment. We moved towards sheltered employment where people were employed at sub-minimum wages in group settings and we, you're probably aware now that that is not an option for students to be transitioning to anymore. Then we moved to job placement, but that was pretty much perceived to be for the most capable and um, placed in regular jobs. So supported employment, especially those with um, most significant disabilities, are placed in community jobs with support and it's all about getting ready to work. Um, customized employment is that you're ready as you are. And another, uh, an example of that is a young man who was um, considered a good producer. He could do repetitive manufacturing type jobs, but his hygiene habits were pretty horrible. Um, uh, I think you can imagine. So <laughs> um, would we want to put him in a dining room setting with bad hygiene? No. Would we want to put him possibly in a manufacturing setting where, where cleanliness wasn't a, um, a, a, an ideal condition of employment? Right. Because some factory jobs, it doesn't make a big deal if, the, if hygiene isn't perfect. So that's where we start looking at ideal conditions of employment. We're looking at um, people who are, are places that meet the conditions of the individual. I'm going to introduce you to Devorah right now. Um, Devorah did not go through employment in high school, but her teacher um, went through customized employment after Devorah graduated and she said, now this is what I could have implemented with Devorah and what I will consider implementing in the, in the coming years. Devorah um, lives with significant barriers to employment, significant medical issues, but we looked at, or her mom looked at, when is she happiest? Well, she's happiest when there's people around. She's happiest when there's music playing. She's, when she's happy, she shows that she's happy by moving her arms. So mom brilliantly put together these baby mittens with different textures at the end of those mittens, dipped them in paint, gave her a frame, and she would paint different colors on the outside of frames. So this took her ideal conditions of employment, her abilities, and her interests, and formed a business. Pretty cool, huh? And um, one of the things that just gives me a pit in my stomach is that there may be times, uh, and I hope it doesn't happen, but there may be times that you hear a family member's unemployable, and there are, are, are no worse words ever. And that's why we want to tell you about customized employment, because 
there is work for everyone in customized employment. And um, Devorah's mother was um, a particularly, and continues to be a particularly strong um, advocate for her, her daughter. And she will not accept unemployable. So she um, has received services from the Social Security Administration through the Plan for Achieving Self-Support. She has received some services through the Division of Rehab Services. Actually, I believe through both of those um, and her business, she is purchasing a van, um, a wheelchair accessible van, where she's able to get around to purchase her frames, to mail those frames out, to go to different fairs, because you might, you might possibly look at that picture of Deborah and say, um, well, how can she have a business? And frankly, that was questioned by um, Department of Rehab Services. Well, she can have a business because she's integrally involved. She does all those things, going to the post office, the FedEx, purchasing frames. She's very involved in her business. So customized employment is based on an interest-based negotiation between the job seeker and the employer. It's person-centered, it's one person at a time, one job at a time, and it ideal, identifies the ideal conditions of employment. Now I wanna say something about that because customized employment isn't the end-all be-all. It, it doesn't have to be for everybody. Um, what we wanna make this be is an option for those where other types of employment haven't worked. I know that there's, um, Barb's son is involved in kind of a group setting, and if that's what works, that's awesome. But as far as customized employment goes, we're usually looking at one job, one person. Um, so customized service is a set of tools, um, and it's um, not the interest inventories. It was de designed for individuals with high or complex support needs, um, but it's uh, applicable to anyone. Um, I don't know if any of you are old enough like me to know about that book, What Color Is Your Parachute? It's kind of based on, on that type of thought. Um, it circumvents going to human resource departments. In fact, in customized employment, if we have to go through a human resource department, we usually say, well, this isn't gonna work. Because when we get into bureaucracies, um, there's always excuses. And that's not the type of work environment we want our folks to be working in. We wanna be work developing business relationships with natural relationships, supports, and training, so that um, when Annie learned her job, she um, was started out with um, a job placement specialist who had been through customized employment, who understood our strategy of systematic instruction. Systematic instruction is basically learning the way the person learns best, and then teaching that way. With Annie, it worked out that we were able to do little index cards on a, a little plastic ring, and with um, pictures and some words, she was able to follow the um, step-by-steps that she needed to prepare for snacks um, at this after-school program. But part of customized employment is having that paid person fade out as fast as possible because we want the relationship to be with the, the manager and the coworkers and have it be natural. One of the best examples of that natural was remember how I said she started out kind of shy and she didn't talk much? Well, when she'd come into work, they'd say, good morning, Annie, and she would either put her head down or grunt and they sat down with her and said, Annie, this isn't cutting it. You know, when we say good morning, we'd like a response back. So that was a very natural conversation. And I'll be darned if she didn't pick up and, and start greeting people that way. Much, much better than the job coach saying, every day you go into work, you say good morning. It, it was much more natural for her to learn this. 
So the principles of um, customized employment um, apply to all workers and the <coughs> negotiations the key. But we want to break those paradigms. We want to um, break that subtle bigotry of low expectations. And this was an important piece that Linda and Barb and I talked about um, at the beginning, and she wanted to make sure that I covered this today. Don't we um, sometimes give people with disabilities a pass? And we're not doing them any favors. It's important to lay a foundation of expectations right away. We want to make sure that we put a value on what they do so that we um, put productivity tied to pay. And that's how we look at the supply side of the business needs. Um, we want to make sure that we, that Americans with disabilities are viewed as economic assets. Now, let me ask you this. Um, have you been shopping places lately that um, employers have hired people with disabilities? What's been your response? Good. Pretty good. Do you go there again? Yeah. Right, right. So this is what we're finding is that we value all people, or if businesses value all people, they're more likely to have a broader customer base. You all are here because you know that you're the key partners. And I couldn't be more thrilled to see how many of you are partners already. I, I didn't ask, um, are, are your family members um, like 14 to 18? Could I have ha a hand? Okay, terrific, awesome. How about 18 to 22? Excellent, there's a few more. Did you all start? Did all the rest of you that um, rose, raised your hands at 18 to 22, did you just start? Or did you start at 14? Okay, so those of you that are starting now, because <laughs> this is what it takes. It starts right at age 14. Well, it starts in preschool, shouldn't it? It should, you know, that what do you want to be when you grow up kind of thinking should be asked of everybody and to be thinking forward that way. Chores um, should be done right away, be given right away. I have... Um, the distinct honor of being a prospective grandmother to a student at Kirk, right? And um, oh my gosh, I am so thrilled with that school because um, he's a young man that was not expected to live past one and now he's in ninth grade. And I know, I'm not sure what this year's job is, but I know last year's job, it was he, he was picking up attendance um, papers every day. So even in eighth grade, he had a job. Um, his identification of um, uh, interests, um, we've noticed that he loves crinkly paper. So birthday, Christmas time comes, I just give him a bag with tissue paper and he is in heaven. We also know he loves giraffes. So um, there's something about that that giraffe that appeals to him. And usually the color green is something he's shown a preference with. So that's something that we're building on um, at, in ninth grade um, for, because there are expectations. The last line on this slide is rather important. And I'm wondering if, if this is a term that you're used to. Social capital. <laughs> I see nodding here. You're learning more and more about social capital. What can I ask you what does it mean to you? Being a part of your community. And social cap capital can be, um, for those of you who are on the board of a Connect to Community, each of you board members brings a circle of social capital. As you parents, you bring social capital in the organizations that you're involved with, the um, community um, pieces that you're involved with. 
All of those connections are so, so, so important for opportunities for your future um, job seekers. I just love the example of um, Barb and Will using their social capital to um, have a snack or breakfast or whatever at Einstein Bagels and finding out that they had a need there with what they were doing with the bagels at the end of the, their day and then building on that. That just started out of a conversation. Another friend of mine um, goes in and pays a bill every month or every quarter for um, parking her RV. So when she went in to pay that bill, she noticed that um, the office area wasn't quite as neat and clean as maybe they would have wanted. And she offered um, that her son could um, do some of those tasks in exchange for a gift card. So it was starting from that little bit of social capital gave him some work experience and broke the door into employment for him. Social capital um, is, is a very important piece in customized employment because it's who you know and who do they know and it's getting introductions. Life begins with a vision and expectations and it's we need to dream big dreams. We want to have to avoid an individual having to live someone else's program. So social capital is to increase the employment of individuals with disabilities by encouraging the use of local contacts and relationships and business contacts. I couldn't laugh when I, I couldn't help but laugh when I saw this slide about qualified, um, the job seeker fits the job versus quality and the job that fits the job seeker because I feel like um, nationally there have been some choices lately where it was um, the job seeker fits the job versus um, the job fitting the job seeker. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have gone there. But <laughs> I, I, when I saw this slide, I thought, boy, what a perfect example. So not all jobs begin with qualifications. Most, peop most businesses are going to tell you that they're looking for an individual that they can trust. That they, that they know is going to be there every day. Do you know what one of the most expensive things about hiring individuals for businesses is? Training. It's, it's going through the hiring process and training. So if you can go to a business and say, this person will be here every day, will be on time, will um, produce what you need to do, maybe not as fast as some of your others, but he'll be one of the most loyal employees that you'll have. Um, and, and he has this abil these abilities. That's what employers want to hear. So um, if we only focus on qualifications, we may lose the potential contributions people could make. Another example of um, a lesson from a person with a disability um, teaching his coworkers was a fellow at Lowe's who had lost um, most of one of his arms. And um, he ended up showing his coworkers how to properly lift with the use of knees or <coughs> um, his arms versus um, his back. And when he came on as an employee for Lowe's, they actually saw a decrease in their workers' comp claims because that coworker helped. And I think we're hearing those types of stories more and more all the time. The phases of customized employment, um, no matter what form of employment development you choose, you have to do these four um, things. You have to start with discovering personal genius. You need to um, gather, or you need to, need to cultivate employment um, opportunities and job development. You need to engage employment supports. 
and you need to provide ongoing support and career development. These are the phases of customized employment. Now let's talk about discovering personal genius. First of all, don't you just love that term? Because we all have a personal genius and we need to take the time to build relationships to find that genius or to, to identify it. Um, it's a unique form of community-based functional assessment. It's um, revealing those vocational themes that I talked about. Um, the themes are not job descriptions. They're um, overarching interests that contain many jobs. And these components of discovering personal genius include creating a positive personal profile, which is one of the things that I was so impressed by at Kirk School with the IEP PowerPoints. It was an extremely positive profile for our grandson. We, we're learning about skills and ideal conditions of employment and use these along with those vocational themes as a roadmap. Um, for employment. But you'll notice on the second part, first one says personal profile, but then there's that very important piece of um, discovery on benefits planning. Um, benefits planning is having to understand what public benefits a person is getting or hopes to be getting and how work could potentially impact those. So it's a very important thing to do. Um, unfortunately, I have a personal experience of helping a person into a job only to have them uh, quit a month later when they um, saw that their supplemental security income check had been reduced due to that income from work. Um, we wanna get that all straight and understood ahead of time. Um, so that we don't have those surprises. Discovering personal genius um, includes that plan, in, discovering personal genius includes that planful approach to reveal life's themes that present a path of discovery that um, begs that you look into it some more and create options. This breeds innovation in job development. The reason I'm, um, I've done several slides now on um, assessment is because those of you that are in school have heard plenty of assessments, haven't you? And what do they really tell you? Um, this is why if we could be incorporating some of the um, steps of discovery in the IEP process, you might be able to get a little bit more information to help the person towards um, a successful transition from school. This particular slide shows the traditional or the conventional ways of assessment where all this student information is filled into this funnel and then you end up with this very tiny vocational goal. Well, what we're looking for is this different approach where the job seeker offers some information, but we take that information and then we look at all the possibilities that come from those themes. So let me give you some examples. Um, when we're thinking about um, different activities around the school that possibly students could be working, um, could be involved in and maybe they haven't traditionally been involved in. How about if a person is interested in the theater? Um, if, if your schools are large enough and there is um, an opportunity to get into the theater department to um, get in the behind the scenes, to do a discovery activity around that, that's an option. We, we often think about um, people's interest in sports, um, looking at all the different behind the scenes activities at the athletic department. Um, public announcement, um, that's another piece that's in school. 
It's looking around, I mean, discovery activities are frequently done out, outside of school, but I'm just thinking about ways that you could be researching and, and developing and doing discovery while the student is in school that doesn't take extra staff time to go places. The other thing is, is that when we do these discovery activities, we really wanna do one staff member to one student because we wanna really be keying in on when is that student happiest? When is that student the most engaged? So um, that's why we want to flip this funnel. And um, we're actually asking the question, who are you? Um, the, we're looking to learn as much as possible about the individual job um, seeker and then take that information to uncover limitless opportunities. The discovery assessment is all about when are you at your best? And I'll ask this of you, when are you at your best? Is it when you're being tested or rather when you're exploring familiar or new places, people and things? So that's what we wanna take from this. This next slide is kind of difficult to read, but it does talk about all of the different ways that we can feed into discovering what a person's vocational themes are. Um, the tasks that people perform, the um, personal um, attributes, the skills, and the um, conditions in work culture. One of the discovery activities that I thought was one of the coolest ones was um, a young man participated in a sheltered workshop in another small town. And his, the executive director of that um, workshop invited this young man to go to a Kiwanis Club meeting with him. So this was a use of social, the executive director's social capital. They went to a meeting and the um, executive director was introducing him around to all different types of people. And um, as they were talking, um, they, they, they got, he got introduced to a per, the, one of the owners of a large auto group. Now this auto group, this was in 2008, and if you'll remember in 2008, the auto industry was tanking. So that wouldn't be your usual um, employer to go to, but they hit it off, this fellow in the Kiwanis Club from the auto group and the young uh, man from the workshop. So the um, young man from the workshop said, hey, would you like to come see where I work? In his, in his own communication, he invited that fellow over to the workshop. And so um, they did go. And so after that visit, the auto group said, well, how about you come see where we work? So they, they went over to, over to the auto group and um, the job placement specialist and Andy were talking with these folks and they found out that there had been quite a few layoffs because of the auto industry um, problems at that time. But because of those layoffs, there were certain duties and tasks that weren't able to be performed anymore. So um, a job was proposed, proposed and then negotiated for this young man to do tasks in the sales department, the parts department, the um, service department, and I believe in the outdoor landscaping a job for, I think it was 20 hours a week, uh, was negotiated. We're, we're doing pretty well. Um, this young man had themes of uh, organization, um, so that fit real well with the parts and the service. Um, sports, and then I think the other one was um, like a hospitality, because he ended up being a pretty outgoing guy. Well, you, again, you can kind of see the organization but where does sports fit in at, at an auto shop? Well, and it goes into what could be his prospective um, manager's office and what should be all over the fellow's office, um, Chicago White Sox 
sports paraphernalia. Well, Andy was a Chicago Cubs person. <laughs> So right off the bat, there was this rapport between the two of them that, you know, anti stuff, but, but rapport. So that's how we take those themes and make them work. We got that initial um, relationship going between those two. So it wasn't just boss, employee. There was this guy thing, oops, guy thing going on that they had that to be um, um, sharing. So just uh, fast forward uh, um, six months or 12 months, and the, uh, the fellow offers um, that Andy come into his office, and he's got this black T-shirt in his hand. And Andy goes, uh-uh, I'm not putting that white socks shirt on. And the guy opened it up, and it actually was their company polo with the white lettering of Andy um, embroidered in there. So he agreed to wear it because <laughs> he was definitely one of the crew. So what we've been talking about with themes and interests is that people connect over those shared interests, and employers connect to potential employees that same way. So themes are not job descriptions. They're big and they hold many, many jobs. And themes open up the possibilities and even the smallest communities. When we're looking at vocational themes, we try to identify three. And the reason we do three is that one isn't enough. And if we have two and have to throw one out, we're back to one, so we want to have three. <laughs> Themes are not precise. Um, they're, they're broad, but they provide guidance for our activities and career development. And themes are also not the sum total of skills and tasks, but they make the theme stronger. Themes are the linchpin of the process. In customized employment, we try to find the jobs behind the jobs. You'll see this iceberg here. We, we've, checked, we've generally been going above the iceberg, but now we want to go below the iceberg. One of my colleagues um, went to a dentist and was talking to someone, talking to the dentist about their work, and they found out that they used a lab they would send out crowns to and different things. So then, we, then they went to that laboratory to find out what happens at that laboratory and so on and so forth. You go to, you keep on going below the iceberg to find out um, the, the jobs. We're, we're um, going up and down the supply chain to jobs. Employment supports, the most typical supports, have to include a thorough job analysis. Just when I said discovering personal genius, we want to know about how income is going to impact um, public benefits. We also need to have a really strong understanding of what the expectations are at the job, and we need to kind of nitpick the different steps of the job. Um, we need to understand if there's um, specialized equipment for the job, and, and we need to find out right away, is there going to be transportation to the job? This is all part of the discovery and the job development. If we're going to be developing a job, we want to make sure that it's one that's truly attainable <laughs> transportation-wise. So customized employment includes negotiated jobs, creating jobs, job carving, or unbundling. Um, it could mean resource ownership, and it could be self-employment or small business. Resource ownership is something that we have not done in Illinois, but I've also always wanted to do it. And here's the way it would work. We um, worked with a health club one time that that health club said, their customers were asking for better towels, and the, their laundry service couldn't provide the um, 
care that those better towels would take. So um, a, a relationship was built with that health club where this young man purchased a special washer and dryer. The um, health club ordered the better towels. This created a job for the young man to be doing the laundry um, as, as he was able. And it was his washer and dryer so that if the job were to end, he would take the washer and dryer. But it was a way that he could help that business and he gets a job. Interesting theory, huh? But it's, it, um, we used to talk about getting a better copy machine. Now we don't <laughs> see, think that so much, but you um, th think about ways that um, a business, a small business might be able to be better if they had an extra resource that could be purchased through um, Division of Rehab Services money along with um, um, Social Security money and um, small business loan money. There's all different ways to make it happen where the person or a job is created through resource ownership. So customized employment job development avoids the market-driven approaches and it re relies on informational interviews, paid job trials. Um, we want to go where the career makes sense. We want to participate in employer councils and work on our social capital. And we need to remember that the task is not to find the dream job, but rather to find the ideal conditions of employment. What are some of your ideal conditions of employment? Mine is being able to meet folks like you. <laughs> well, that's an ideal condition. Yes. A livable wage. A livable wage. Yep. How about does it make a difference if you're in well-lighted rooms? How about being able to play your own music? These are all um, ideal conditions of employment. So I'm going to introduce another young man to you. He's actually from Kansas. But I just wanted to kind of talk to you about per perceptions and um, how those perceptions can kind of deter us. Well, Joe, um, this is Joe. But in school, he was Joseph. And in, in school, he was combative. He was non-communicative. He had a very, very, very low IQ. And so right off the bat, his parents recognized that the labor market employment would not work for their Joseph. But Joe loves people. He loves being out of doors. He loves noise. So dad got to thinking, how about we, um, he purchased a kettle corn um, kettle. And he started a popcorn stand out of Walmart in their Kansas community. Well, from that little job trial, Joe now lives in his own home with his um, supports. His company has gross supports of se or gross earnings over $75,000. Joe has many part-time workers working on his payroll. He's got a mail order business. He still goes to county fairs. But um, this fellow who was combative and not a very happy guy in school is living the life right now because he's out amongst people. He's, um, you can see he's a public speaker. Um, that's his dad running the PowerPoint with the uh, voice activated narration. Um, and here's another life changing piece about Joe was that Joe um, um, does not use words for communication. He obviously can show it through his actions. But one time mom and dad were with him at a county fair and um, Joe went out in the grassy area and said, do you want to buy some popcorn? And again, if mom and dad hadn't been there, they wouldn't have believed it. 
here's a young man that doesn't use words, but he was able to use words. So discovery consists of seeing what everyone has seen, but thinking what nobody has thought. <clears throat> I'm going to um, go through these next few slides because it's specifically about um, self-employment, and I think we've talked about it a little bit. Um, I did want to leave this one slide up because it just goes to show there's a business for everything. Of course, this is out in Montana, so we don't see it very often, but there's a business for everything. This is another story of um, in Illinois where the fellow um, had just a really tough start after school. Um, he had a hard time finding a place to live. Um, he was just not very happy. But then he went on um, to um, move into his own house and with his own supports. And his parents had this um, um, committee that helps to support him. And they got together and they thought about what makes Brian happiest. Well, what makes him happiest are quarters and the Cubs and the Bulls and fire departments. So when you think about quarters, where does that take you? Vending machines. So he also likes, um, I'm pretty sure he's our Pepsi guy. He likes Pepsi products. So he started a vending business um, that he started putting these uh, Pepsi machines at fire departments. And um, his business has now grown to more than 20 different businesses around his county. I will take a moment to talk about this um, slide that says, um, Everyone needs a Wilson. Those of you that have seen the movie Castaway, um, Tom Hanks was reliant on that um, volleyball, Wilson, the Wilson volleyball, and, and we all need Wilson. And I think that's what I'd like to uh, make sure you all understand is that by your being here today, you're reaching out to your community you're making um, connections, and that's what we want to do. It's, you've got a rich community full of resources, and you want to make sure that you're not doing it on your own, um, but that you can be um, reaching out to these different resources. When we think about businesses, we have to think about, is the business going to be making money? We know that it can be answering a need for a passion, but we, we um, in the end, want to make sure that it's making money. So I've listed a couple pages of resources on self-employment um, for you to refer to. But let's go to the work incentive piece. We've got a, a half an hour, and um, I think that's just about enough time so I don't leave you glassy-eyed um, with Social Security information. Working in benefits planning goes hand in hand. Um, we have to start out with that benefits planning in discovery. We want to know which public benefits are being received now, if they're, um, people might be on the DD waiver, Maybe they're in the in Silla home. They could be getting DRS home support. We just need to know all of that information. But starting off, do you think these programs are easy to understand? Challenging to understand, but not rocket science? Or rocket science? <laughs> it can seem one of each of those at some time. Well, today, I was kind of hoping to start some positive rumors. Um, and maybe some of this information is new to you, but I want to make sure you leave today knowing that students who are receiving supplemental security income can and should be earning up to $1,790 a month, and they keep their whole SSI check. 
Did you know that? No. Woo it's students. These are for students, and I'm gonna be, I have a whole slide on this. But I just wanna make sure that you know that there's this student earned income exclusion. How about, did you know that if a person is SSI eligible on Medicaid, they can work and earn up to $27,000 a year. They're not gonna get their SSI check, but they'll still keep their Medicaid for free. Now we're not talking huge money, but that's sure a heck of a lot more than that $775 or whatever the, $735 a month, right? So this is why we wanna say work is good and we want people working. That's gonna be the 1619B work incentive I have a slide on. And here's another question. If a person's earning 1,000, let's say they're earning $1,500 a month and they're not a student, how, if their person's on SSI, can they earn $1,500 and still be on SSI? Yes, 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 yes. So we're gonna talk about this, the earned income exclusion. So it doesn't this sound encouraging? That work is good and life is better when people are working. So these are the positive rumors I want you guys to go away with. Did you know it's true? So let's do some basics. The basics are that there are two disability cash programs for Social Security. And it's really, really important to understand which cash benefit program the person's receiving those benefits under because the work incentives differ for both. And if a person's on both programs, they, they're the lucky ones that get to follow all of the work incentives. So I want you to know that there's resources available from the Work Incentives Planning and Assistance Project to help you navigate these rules, okay? There's help out there. So we know that a person on um, SSI has very strict income and resource limits the resource limit is $2,000. And the month, the full federal benefit rate this year is $735. So we're not talking much at all. And that's why that we say a person is almost always, always better off working than um, not working. Social Security Disability Insurance is a different program altogether. It's based on a work record either the individual or their parent. There aren't any income or asset limits. If Oprah or Bill Gates were be to become disabled, they could get a, dis a social security disability cash benefit. There, the amount that is received under a social security disability insurance depends on the person's work record. The, this, um, Childhood disability beneficiary is a specific um, classification for a person on social security disability insurance. And this is where if the individual's parent becomes of retirement age and starts collecting social security retirement, their child might be eligible for a, a disability benefit on their, off the parent's record. If one of the parents becomes disabled and gets um, social security disability insurance, the child could get a benefit. Or if one of their parents passes away, that child um, or a, a, adult child could get a disability benefit. The thing about this that is so important is that when that individual with a disability becomes eligible off of their parent's record, 24 months later, they become eligible for Medicare, which is the federal group health insurance. So um, 
24 months after being determined, they could get Medicare. And if they're already getting Medicaid, they continue getting Medicaid. So that's two different in, um, paths towards insurance. Usually, um, parents love hearing about this particular slide because those of you that have your students working and earning while they're in school, before the age of 24, an individual only needs six work credits to become eligible for Social Security disability insurance on their own record. And why is this important? Because 24 months after they become eligible for disability insurance on their own record, they become eligible for Medicare. And that Medicare and Medicaid together is really helpful for individuals. So we want to very much encourage anyone below the age of 24 in particular to be working and earning. Now in 2017, when Social Security work credit is earned with earnings of $1,300 gross income, but a person could earn up to four credits in a calendar year, January to December. So 5,200 is that limit. So let's talk about individuals who are on supplemental security income because there are some amazing work incentives. I already referred to the student earned income exclusion. There's a plan for achieving self-support. There's the earned income exclusion, which I referred to. There are impairment related work expenses. And then there's that mystical 1619. So the main thing to know when a person is working and receiving cash benefits, they have to report that income monthly to Social Security and the Department of Human Services. I, I usually say, this is my favorite work incentive, but you're gonna hear me say that on each one of these next slides. Because this student earned income exclusion shows how Social Security really wants their recipients to get work experience. And what better way to get work experience than when you're in school and you have the access to occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, um, job coaches, your teachers. So the student earned income exclusion are for recipients of supplemental security income that's that $735 a month. If they're under the age of 22 and in some sort of school, it could be community college for a class or two. It could be high school, it could be university, it could be trade school, it could be homeschooled. You just need to proactively prove to Social Security every fall that yes, this person is going to be a student. Um, Social Security thinks that when you turn 18, you're out of school. So you have to continually show them every year that yes, they are eligible for the student earned income exclusion, which means that they could earn this up to eight, almost $1,800 a month, plus keep that $773. That's a lot of work experience. And the 1790, that's more than a, a credit of um, work right there. It could be in a month, but realistically, it, it, a, lot of, a lot of folks don't actually get, get to earn that much. But that's a huge incentive. Um, so it's up to an annual exclusion of $7,200. And we want to make sure that this is known that it's for supplemental security income. It's not for those dependents under Social Security Disability Insurance. Now, didn't I say that one of the rules for SSI is that you have to keep more, um, you can't have more than $2,000? Yeah, so that's a lot of money that the student has to spend every month, which I suppose wouldn't necessarily have to be a problem, but another way to, to help this or to 
allow a person to have more than $2,000 a month is to um, use this plan for achieving self-support. I'm just going to make you aware of the 1619 program um, because it's an unknown work incentive that you can, in Illinois, you can earn up to $27,102, not get an SSI check, but still keep Medicaid without a spend down. The work incentives for Social Security Disability Insurance are different, and I'm listing them right here. And then the last slide, um, oh, I'm sorry. This slide was about um, the fact that earning work credits before the age of 24 is a good thing, because getting six credits before the age of 24 is easier than um, it goes up incrementally up. And like our age, we need 40 credits, so only six is a big deal. The rest of this is resource information, and I would like to offer up for questions right now. If you have a question, raise your hand. We'll give you the mic so everybody can hear the question, okay? What is our work credit? A work credit is a credit towards your ability to get Social Security retirement or in the case of our family members, disability insurance. So a work credit is um, essentially credit towards insurance through the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. And this year, a work credit equals $1,300. So if a person earns $1,300 um, and pays into FICA taxes, proves to the IRS that they've earned that $1,300, Social Security will assign them one work credit. Does that help? The main thing is, is it, it affords entry into the Social Security Disability Insurance Program that then can um, offer entry into Medicare. We, through our FICA taxes, earn 40 credits and then we are eligible for Social Security re retirement. The same thing happens for people with disabilities. They could be eligible for disability insurance once they get 40 credits, but that's really hard to do for some people. So it's much easier and better to get the six before t age 24. Okay? If your SSI is reduced because of your income and you lose that income, can you reapply for SSI and bring it back up to the 735? Well, actually, that what you're just describing, if a person loses their SSI check due to income, that means that their income is over that 1553 or 1555, um, first of all, they continue free Medicaid coverage up to that addition, that um, $27,000. So, I want you to know that you're, that person's way better off working. But say that job ends, or say the, those hours get cut, all a person has to do is notify Social Security, these are my new hours, this is my new monthly pay, and they, they will quickly, the next month, should get their SSI check back again. There's no reapplication, no. The thing about 1619, is you want to, the um, free, continued free Medicaid, you want to check in every year and show that you're seeing the doctor at least once a year and that you're working and then you continue that free Medicaid. And that's how you can, if your income goes down, you just go call Social Security and you go right back on that SSI check. There's no reapplication, nothing. Make another question. Um, what if your child never received any benefits at all? Should you start asking if she's never really been diagnosed with anything? Well, 
If she's never been diagnosed, you might have a little difficulty being found disabled. Um, the adult rules for meeting disability it, are very strict. It's all about showing and proving that that individual is not capable of earning and working what's called substantial gainful activity. I believe I put that on the Social Security Disability Insurance um, slide that I skipped over. Um, In 2017, you would need to prove that your family member is not able to earn and work of um, up to $1,170 gross earnings a month. So it's possible to do, but you need um, medical records. Your school could be very helpful to you in that um, if your, your family member has tried to work and you can list why you have not been able to, why that student is not able to have earnings. There are um, some lawyers around that I bet Connect Com to Community might recommend to you that could give you advice on that as well. I'm with an organization that provides vocational services but not customized employment yet? Yes. How many hours does it take to find someone a customized employment job? Well, generally, we're going to say that it might take a little bit longer to find a person um, customized employment because we put so much into discovery. And um, because we are not answering want ads, we're building relationships within the community, getting to know businesses, so and then we're negotiating employment. So I can't give you the amount of hours, but um, okay, good. Connect to community will address their experiences. Say you have a, um, you do get those six credits, and now you have SSDI. How much can you work? Um, what is this trial work period? Can you explain that a little bit more? It's, the, the work incentives are totally different for disability insurance because um, it w the program was developed for individuals who actually it was developed after um, wars and veterans were coming back um, injured from wars. So it was developed for individuals with a work history so Social Security understood that um, the person would want to try work out to make sure they understand exactly how much they can work without jeopardizing their health. So the trial work period is actually something that you kind of want to take seriously. If the person, um, if your young person is um, working and has the opportunity to earn more than $840 a month in gross earnings, they're go you're going to want to have them work at least $1,000 or $1,200. You don't want to work and have earnings at $841. You want to really test their ability. And this is just my opinion. That's not in the Social Security Red Book, but it's just from my experience. So when you use a trial work period, you can, excuse me, you continue to get your social security disability insurance. For a young student, it's, excuse me, it's very likely that they're going to still get some SSI. They keep both of those cash benefits. Well, the SSI might go up and down depending on if they're a student, but they keep their SSDI benefit and it's for nine months. Now those nine months don't have to be reoccurring months. They are over a rolling 60 month period. So say your person is working as a gift wrapper at um, holiday time. 
So they work and they have earnings of $1,000 a month in November, December of one year. Well, they could do that for five years in a row and still not use their trial work period month because they've only used two months every year. It's, 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 it's a trick. So you're gonna wanna work with a um, community work incentives coordinator. And that was one of the resources on your lat later pages. We only have time for a couple quick more questions. I'm coming to you. Here you go. Excuse me, in customized employment models, um, does the um, worker have to be paid the minimum wage? Yes. Yes. Or more. <laughs> customized employment is real pay for real work. So um, that isn't to say that folks haven't done volunteer work, um, that they don't do job trials. But the goal of customized employment is always the prevailing rage, wage, whatever that may be. You guys had some great questions. This early. We weren't able to get to everybody. We want to keep on track here. I can tell you, Marcy, that was an amazing presentation. Let's hear it for Marcy. Thank you.